I give thanks once again for the privilege of greeting you in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord and doing so with the anticipation that His blessings would be upon us as we open the Word of God together and as we endeavor to communicate the gospel by this means, how we thank God that we are made to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we are made to realize that he as the conqueror of all things and who has defeated all that would be of consequence to us and thus has given us peace that we are able to be delivered from the cares, the affairs of this present world and are rather enabled to have our focus not only on the consolation that we have in him now but that we might truly be in anticipation of that which is to come. I do thank God for each one of you, and I thank you and thank God for the privilege that we have of fellowship together from time to time, and I do pray that each of us will be in that way of remembrance of each other, especially when we know of particular needs, and there are some that have been brought before the churches, and of those, we would urge you to be much in prayer, but that we just simply intercede one for another regarding the Lord's favor upon those whom we love. And so I would direct your attentions into that way of a present waiting, as it were, upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, of course, I have called to our attention just now, and it seems to dominate with uh, a lot of us that all the news that we're looking for is, what about the virus? And, of course, there are other things that are going on in our land and around the world, tragic things in, in way of our thoughts. But God knows, and He is in control and he, from time to time, I believe, must show these things to his people that they would flee to him and there to discover the wonders of tender mercies and grace indeed. In the meantime, he has left us directions as to how we are to conduct ourselves in this present world. And with that thought in mind, we go to the Word of God and look there to several aspects of the Word, those things which are direct teachings, precepts. We go to those things which reveal to us the wonders of a salvation that is by grace alone, and thus find assurance there and the ability to rest fully upon what Christ has accomplished. Then we are likewise given examples. We're given examples two ways. One of them is to look to those men uh, and uh, those that have been set before us, not men only, but women also, in terms of they who have obeyed the Lord, who have followed His example, have known the blessings. And I think of some that are named, and, and that's good. I think of, of Eunice and Lois, uh, the mother and grandmother of Timothy. And then there's some like the widow who cast in all of her living, even though it only amounted to two mites. She gave everything that she had. And so these examples are there before us. But of course, the greatest example of all is that of the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, and then has taught us that you love one another as I have loved you. And so it is that Peter would call attention, seeing that you have purified yourselves through the love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And that we would do. So um, let's go to the Lord just now, seek his blessings upon what we're about to do. Father, I thank you. I praise you for your goodness and mercy to us to every kindness that you've made us to realize, and Lord, every blessedness that we know, we have it through the finished work of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so I ask your blessing just now upon us as we would open the Word of God together. 
I do pray for our people, for our nation, for um, the, the propagation of the gospel throughout the world and that in order that you might be glorified and Christ Jesus be exalted to the position that uh, in, in men's hearts that he occupies today in heaven at the right hand of power on high, ruling and reigning in all things. It's in his name that I pray and give thee thanks and amen. Now then, I want to look again in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. And it was back in the third chapter, I think it was, that in that very first verse, the Apostle Paul said, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And, of course, what we found out was that that finally was not the end of the book because he went on for two more chapters following that. But now we come to another, finally, in verse 8 of chapter 4. And, again, there are some things that he has clearly set before us. There is the urging that even as we have heard of him, as we have learned of him, as we have witnessed the experiences of Paul, heard the testimony of Paul, and see that he um, looked to, and it was his desire, uh, that in him all things would be counted lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, his Lord, my Lord, and your Lord. And would to God that we all might view the things of this world in exactly that way. Elsewhere we read, forgetting those things which are behind, we press on. And this the Apostle Paul also said, therefore, that uh, in the 13th verse of the third chapter, reaching forth unto those things which are before. And he pressed for the mark. And that mark was the perfection that is in Jesus Christ and for the prize. And that prize was and is Jesus Christ. It is, and he declared it in that way, that I might win Christ. And so, having said that, he urges us then, the beginning of this fourth chapter, that we stand fast. And he identifies us in a very affectionate manner and identified these people to whom he wrote. And indeed, it is wonderful to see the way that he has addressed these things. And it's good that we might there endeavor to imitate, even as we think upon one another. How did he talk about these people, his brothers and sisters in Christ in the church at Philippi? It was my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown. And so there were some things that he encouraged, but among those was to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. There was the urging of let your moderation and that is your steadfastness. Let, your, let things be clearly uh, understood. Be in control that we might know that the Lord is at hand. And so we need not to be in panic mode. We need not be in a way of seeking under the things of this world, thinking that there we may have something. And so he taught us, be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious. We need not be anxious. If indeed I were able to see far into the future and to realize that, that in those ages to come, I shall lie in the bosom of Christ in perfect peace, experiencing perfect joy, rejoicing at the privilege of being able to adore Him and thus to experience fully the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we know now. Would I be worrying about a virus? Would I be worried about the unrest that is in the world today? And I think not. And so the idea then is that we engage in what I would call, and I would title our message this, gracious thinking, gracious thinking. And so having urged us to, with thanksgiving, to let our requests be made known unto God, Paul then says in verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now he's going to say that again. He wants, us, wants that emphasized. But in verse 8, and here we begin the two verses of our text for this evening, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, 
whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, we're going, that, that is sort of a break point because from there on, that uh, he's he's going to talk about some other issues relative to them, and we'll pick those up in messages to come as the Lord wills. But here we would understand the manner of thought that should be with us in opposition either to a way of legalistic thinking, which legalistic thinking is that of uh, trying to operate as in a servile position under the law. We know freedom in Jesus Christ. We have been granted perfect liberty in Him. And so the idea that I have to live or that I am living under a set of rules without regard to the operations of the Spirit of God within me becomes a very uncomfortable situation because one who is honest will discover that he cannot live up to those things. He can never meet the standard. And so he is totally dependent upon the fact that we are taught in the Word of God that he writes his laws in our hearts and in our minds and our sins and iniquities he remembers no more. And having that good word we realize that we do have a moral structure, we have a moral example, we have a moral directive, if you will, to live in all honesty before God. And this we would do. And of course, the other extreme of that is to come to the place, and I've heard people say that uh, when indeed they were challenged as far as their behaviors were concerned, and they'll say, well, I'm not under law, I'm under grace and would presume upon the grace of God. And that would, of course, be a way it's referred to as antinomianism or against law and moving in just such a way as that. Uh, there, the, And these are those that would go ahead and act in a very worldly manner, that which would be more characteristic of one given over to worldly things rather than to look to the things of God and to rejoice, as it were, in, not, in the righteousness of Christ, not only as that which is given us, but also in that which is experienced by us. And so this we would urge then upon you, that we, this is what I'm talking about, when thinking in a proper manner, it's thinking relative to whose we are and whom we serve. And so we have moved then from the description of a life of prayer uh, to those things that should guide and occupy our very thoughts. And I think this is of particular importance. As Christians, we're often confronted by questions of what is right and wrong for us, and we find ourselves then driven to the Scripture to discover exactly what we might have there as definitive answers. I think that it was going to hurt something just or read something just the other day, and I thought it was so appropriate having struggled often with the thing that was dealt with there. And it was, it was this that said you cannot, by thinking about it, stop yourself from having bad thoughts. And I have found myself often bad thoughts come to my mind. And, and the devil just will whisper these things and things from out of my past or whatever it might be. And, and these things, they're, they're, when they're realized what they are, they're horrifying to a true believer. So I find myself thinking, no, don't think that. Stop that. That, that just simply is, is not, to be, not acceptable in any way, shape, manner, or form. 
But the writer of this thought said you can't stop yourself from thinking about those bad things by thinking about it, but you can only do that by thinking about something else. And I have often heard people when they wanted to distract somebody from whatever was going around say, whatever you do, don't think about um, uh, pink elephants. And of course, with the idea in mind that that pink elephant gets in there and then you just keep thinking about it. Well, I'm not going to think about it. Well, why am I talking about it? And you see the frustration. Well, when indeed we go to the more positive things, when we go to the righteousness of Christ. And this thought crossed my mind just again the other day. Something went through my mind that was unpleasant, inappropriate. And the first thing I did was, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the next thing you know, I was going through the whole psalm. And that ugly thought, which I can't remember what it was now, was gone. And so as we focus our attention upon the gracious things of God, those things given us in Christ, the beauties of our Lord, how precious indeed it becomes to us. And so we need to give concern to this. And so the world watches. The world's watching you. The world watches me. And sometimes it's for guidance. They might look to you and say, well, I think that is a good way to deal with things. Or that they might look and say, well, that person <clears throat> gives strong evidence that he walks with the Lord. <clears throat> He's doing things the right way. But on the other hand, it may be that they're watching, trying to discover something whereby they might accuse. And when indeed they accuse us, they're accusing the efficacy of the grace of God in our lives. And so we must not give them occasion for that. It is to us. It is to us. But it is them saying, well, if he's supposed to be a Christian, so I guess what I'm doing is all right. They will find ways to use your ill behavior to uh, justify or to rationalize whatever it is they're doing. But the grace of God manifests itself in the mind and in the heart of believers so that when it is followed, it both provides example and it removes the occasion to accuse our lives. And, and I think this is good. Satan is an accuser, and he will try to get you to accuse yourself. And we are all worthy of accusation. But on the other hand, when we recognize what Christ has done, what he has accomplished, and that he is not charging us with our sins, then we need to learn to receive and to rejoice in the forgiveness that we have in him and to recognize that it is the blood of Christ which cleanses us from all our sins. And so we are not limited in those things enabled by the work of Christ in us. And thus we may say whatsoever with great delight as we sense the grace of God in us. So the things that we are given as the operation or as the work of Christ, these things come to us and they come to us very preciously. And so th that, that we are able that uh, whatsoever uh, that we pursue in the matters of the grace of God, we can do so with great delight as we are sensing the grace of God in us. So now we look, first of all, and I want to give you this, three important things that regarding Christian function in this present world. And I'm going to go outside of our text. But number one, in Romans 6, 14, we're giving these reassuring and encouraging words. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, I quoted that a while ago. And the, but listen to the thought. The idea of somebody trying to keep the law is that they're trying to self-conquer sin. Now, what does the apostle say here? You're not under the law. You are not going to be able to live up to the law. 
The law is beautiful. The law is precious. The law is spiritual. But he said in another place, we're sold under sin. But as we look to these thoughts and the thought that sin shall not have dominion over you, and that is our actions are not to be controlled by the sin that remains in us. We all have an old nature still with us, still hanging around, still trying to stir things up, still trying to create problems for us. But we have a new nature, born from above, a new nature. That which is born of God cannot sin. It's born of incorruptible seed. And so we have that, the righteousness of God, imparted to us in our very persons. But rather, we are directed by the gracious principles placed in us. And that is what he means by being under grace. Grace is dictating to us. And I once heard uh, a wise man make a statement. We were discussing an issue concerning something that was under the law as opposed to being under grace. And he made this statement. He said, grace never came behind law in anything. And so we even read in that first chapter of Romans or first verse of Romans 8 concerning no condemnation. But go on then a few verses and what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. But the law couldn't do it, but the grace of God can and therefore dictates to us this life of God, this manner of life that reflects the power and presence of Christ in us, this life which does not grieve the Holy Spirit, this life which is rather very expressious, expressive of the, the, the work of Christ in us. And then there is a second verse that I would have you to understand. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, made this statement. He said, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, it seems like a strange situation. What is Paul saying? I, I can do whatever, and I don't think that he is saying that I can go rob a bank if I want to. This was not what he had in mind. But what he did have in mind is this, that there are many things that are not immoral, they're not wrong in and of themselves, and yet they pose a problem for some. Uh, this was addressed in the latter chapters of the book of Romans, that we need to be concerned about those that might misunderstand something that we are doing. And what we're doing, our motives may be well placed, but at the same time, it is coming across to somebody else in a wrong way. Now, we can take one of two positions. You can say, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I have a right to do this. And the question that I have often asked is this, do you have the freedom not to do it? Quite often when we think we have a right, we think that we are bound to actually uh, exercise that right. That we've got, to, in order to prove that we have the right, we've got to go ahead and do whatever it is. But true liberty uh, will enable us. Not all things are worthwhile. Not all things are necessary. And for that reason, um, they, they call to us to exercise liberty. That, that is not to, not to be dominated by those things, not to be dictated by those things. When I look to be led by the Spirit, when I seek the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the idea that something else may be dictating my life, may be directing my life, and it may be taking precedent over the things of God. Well, Paul says this quite simply in that passage of Scripture. I will not be brought under the power of any. That is, of anything. So liberty claimed for personal reasons becomes power over us. And this, of this we must be careful. So we look again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul again comes across this thought, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. That is, I don't have to do them. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. 
Not everything builds up in the most holy faith. And then the third thing is our text. The third principle. First of all, that sin shall not have dominion over you. Secondly, that that not all things are expedient. I don't have to do those things. I have liberty not to. But then the third thing we are told to do is think on some things. Think on these things. And that's he gives us a precious list of things to occupy our thoughts. The finally here is not so much again to close the epistle as it is to bring personal prayer and devotion to full expression in our lives. Bring that devotion to, to full expression, to full benefit, not only to us, but to others. Whatever, whatsoever, is used six times to express those things that apply to all. So we can't pick and choose over these things. And so as, as he sets these before us, and I'm just going to give you a brief rundown of what they are. Whatsoever things are true, that is openly true, as known to be consistent with the Word of God. I said it a while ago, the Lord is my shepherd. And I might read, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. I might have various thoughts. The Lord is my light and my salvation. These things are true. Think about them. Think about the benefit that they are to us. Think about the source of grace and mercy that is to be found in Jesus Christ and in his suffering and death. And so whatsoever things are honest, that is, they're venerated, they're respected, they're recognized, even the ungodly recognize that virtue of honesty in the life of an individual. And so that, that with that being said, they're worthy of respect or of being reverenced. And so we think on those things. And that, that thought of coming across with one who is straightforward and is true to his testimony. Whatsoever things are just, that which we know to be right or righteous, these are things to think on. This is something to think about. To be pure, whatsoever things are pure. And that is chast in word and deed. Some copies render this as whatsoever is holy. So not just pure, but holy. To think upon the holiness of God. To think upon our life of prayer with Him. To think upon us in the presence of God and to be moved in that way. Whatsoever things are lovely, that is acceptable or good, even among those who are merely mortal, that which promotes friendship among men as opposed to contentiousness and strife. We can always find those grounds. How easily it is that we see an argument about to develop with somebody, a bone of contention, a point of disagreement. And as one begins to express something, if you're thinking in the right way and rather to come to something lovely, and you might just simply divert attention and say, isn't that mountainside over there beautiful? Or have you ever just sat down and looked at the beauty of a flower? And whatsoever things are lovely, go to pleasant thoughts. Go to those thoughts that nobody's going to disagree about. Nobody is going to be contentious about. Now, this doesn't say we don't stand for truth. So whatsoever things are of good report, that is considered good by all, saved and unsaved, but then we must set forth the gospel. So when he adds to that then, uh, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So moral excellence and intelligence um, these these are things to occupy our attention, such that such that praise for it is not unseemly. That it's a good thing to give thanks for. Perhaps the view is to the good of this world in in this world because of divine constraints. Think on these things in the sense of taking control and being responsible for our thoughts. And so it is that Paul would add here 
his word and his uh, expression of control. These things which you have both learned and received and heard and, and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. I choose that way. I love that way of being able to think on these things that direct my attention into a patient waiting upon the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you is my prayer this evening.